Hello vinyl community, hello VC. Just another of my usual record oriented videos. But first uh, I wanted to show you my new turntable because I bought me this little and rather price worthy toy. Um, a fully automatic uh, turntable by Audio Technica. And uh, that's a nice gadget just doing its job. So this cost only 150 dollars or euro. It's more or less the same. Um, this is the model ATLP60X uh, with this USB upgrade, but I have not tested the USB. I only looked for a turntable that has a analog change out and this one had it. Why? Why are you asking? <laughs> So um, uh, the thing is that uh, if you have seen some of my uh, transgressive music videos then you probably saw that I do have a Technics uh, 1210 uh, Mark II and uh, don't worry, uh, the 1210 is fine. It is a turntable that I have downstairs now right next to my record collection and I always thought I want to have a second turntable just here connected to um, my iMac here on the left and uh, for example to create some mp3s out of uh, records that I don't have in a digital format and uh, so I was looking for something that is actually not that expensive um, but at first I thought yeah this is gonna cost me like 400 500 dollars if I want something uh, in, in the area where better technology starts uh, but uh, then I thought let's read a bit Let's read up a little bit on these really cheap turntables. Of course I know that uh, there are people, not that much in the VC, but let's say in the in the social bubble of audiophiles, that uh, enjoy making rather dismissive videos about this type of turntables, like something you shouldn't touch with the tip tips of your fingers. Um, I do disagree. Um, is it significantly worse turntable than my 1210 well of course i mean my 1210 kind of costs 10 times more so it is expected that it sounds better which he certainly does i mean it's funny because my uh, concord cartridge with the orthophone gold needle that i have in my 1210 did cost exactly as much as this entire turntable <laughs> so it is expected that there are differences that is okay but um First of all, when I got this gadget, the, the assembly was pretty easy. This was done like in three and four minutes. And the, the first record I put on the turntable was a Frank Zappa album. And it sounded pretty fine. I mean, in, 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 the, in the area of treble, I think it cuts a little more aggressive um, compared with the, the 1210 that has a much kind of warmer, more pleasant sound. Um, and uh, of course, this is a fully automatic uh, belt drive turntable so um, sure it's kind of a, it's a bit of a toy but um, I don't need it here for anything that I would consider too serious and so I'm actually kind of happy with it and um, and I think there is a place for turntables like that um, for a particular reason and I'm saying this with a certain um, feeling of selfishness probably because I want the vinyl world, the vinyl industry that had been resurrected in the course of the last 10-15 years, I want it to grow because there are just at least 1000 albums recorded in the last 60 years that definitely need to be repressed and released again and this will only happen um, when there is a kind of a healthy kicking industry around, around it. And this can only happen if you have kind of beginner's technology that allows someone an entry into this type of world without uh, completely savaging your bank account. You know what I mean? Particularly with young people. Um, if, if we expect them to join this world but it can only work if they spend like 600 or 700 dollars on their first turntable then it's going to fail most obviously 
and um, I think those those gadgets are kind of quite quite good to, for example, if you have children and these children are interested uh, in being introduced to the world of records and vinyl technology and they still do have a football or basketball in their in their own room <laughs> you will certainly not set up a two thousand dollar bunked and olufsen sound system in their room just uh, waiting to be destroyed by a ball or <laughs> a bat or something so if somebody breaks this turntable um, you can still give them a hard time about it but in truth it doesn't really hurt you that much <laughs> so um, I think uh, that's kind of uh, what I had to say about this turntable um, I mean, people say don't put your records on a turntable like this because you destroy your record with it that's I mean I would need to see some real interesting scientific evidence for those kind of uh, uh, urban stories uh, being told about cheap turntables I mean Yes, there can be situations where a needle is basically bad for your for your record, but this usually goes hand in hand with uh, with an acoustic signal that shows you pretty clearly that something is going wrong. Um, if uh, if the record sounds rather okay or good, then the needle is not destroying your groove. Um, anyway, so uh, let's go downstairs and talk about some records. So meanwhile I had a little meal and changed my t-shirt and uh, so a little more time passed by than um, intended but um, here we go. Let's have a look at some records I have been listening to in the last um, two or three weeks maybe since my last uh, video probably and um, it seems to me that I finally managed to sit on camera in a black t-shirt without any white cat hair um, at least it seems like it which uh, well not entirely but um, it's almost impossible in this household anyway let me start with a band that I consider to be really amazing and um, that uh, I've actually discovered for myself not that long ago and that's kind of a great thing because um, it's kind of nice to realize that even in a rather advanced age I'm still able to fall in love with the band and become totally um, fascinated by their music and you know what they say, they always say that you basically discover uh, the groundwork for your musical taste when you are 14 or 15 and everything else uh, that follows is just some kind of a derivative uh, state of that uh, first uh, encounters and maybe to some to some extent this is true but uh, at the same time one should always challenge uh, such notions and uh, try to experience it differently as I did with this band I'm talking about Agitation Free um, this is their first album Malesh now um, I did know about them vaguely because this is the type of uh, German uh, psychedelic rock or kraut rock as some people call it which I most of the time don't uh, this is one of those bands that's being mentioned um, often uh, when people talk about German music of the 70s and uh, so uh, they have uh, their own place uh, in that history um, interestingly this came out I think 1972 and uh, at this boy, at this point, um, the band had already existed for at least four years, uh, but they never released an album in those early days, and they were more like a ja jam band, kind of psychedelic jam band, and um, more improvisational. And uh, interestingly, as far as the story goes, uh, they got an invitation by the German Goethe Institute. The the Goethe Institute is this foundation that basically promotes uh, German language around the world. I know them because when I was a kid uh, and we came to Germany and I didn't speak any German at this point in time, uh, we all got language books from the Goethe Institute for studying and stuff like that uh, for free of course and um, so they uh, approached Agitation Free and invited them to make a little tour uh, to the Middle East. They certainly were 
on Cyprus. I think they played in Lebanon and uh, most probably in Egypt in, because there's a whole bunch of photographs from, from Egypt with pyramids inside the, the sleeve. Um, so, um, but they came back and recorded this their, their debut album and uh, it's kind of nicely influenced by Middle Eastern music and they're all kind of interesting uh, atmospheric recordings just done with a microphone in the streets of one of those cities and kind of interwoven with the music. Um, so this is a quite a wonderful debut album of this uh, instrumental band. Um, now these agitation free records that had all been now re-released so um, I kind of bought all of them. Um, and uh, this is their second album called Aptly Second. Now many fans of uh, this band uh, are considering this being their best record. Um, it's the one album where they probably got the deepest into progressive rock. Um, at the same time a lot of, uh, kind of proto-ambient moments and a lot of psychedelic rock and uh, some a uh, lot of soloing and great kind of guitar sounds and uh, so it's quite a wonderful album. Now I've been listening to Agitation Free now for maybe two weeks almost exclusively. Uh, just constantly going through their discography and uh, it's a fascinating band. Um, I think they were extremely influential. Uh, some of the stuff here sounds extremely ahead of its time. Uh, there's even one track that almost have this feeling of, uh, of, of um, neo-folk or something like that. Like something you would expect from a band like Current 93. So um, very very experimental and uh, at the same time very pleasant to listen so it's not a noisy band it's uh, they are always creating these kind of very pleasant soundscapes but uh, it, they always sound very very original now right now my favorite of their albums actually is this one this one is called last and was their third record and uh, came out after the band had already stopped or disbanded and um, this is uh, to some extent a live album. There are only three tracks. That's how I like my records <laughs> with the three tracks on it. Um, but it's the type of live album where you would probably not notice that it's live because you don't hear the audience. Uh, it's very well recorded. Um, I think the, the long track, the 22 minute track on the B-side called Looping 4 is actually been had been recorded in a radio studio type of setting so um, it's live but not with an audience so that certainly adds to the quality of the sound but overall their way of playing live and their way of recording albums in a studio was not that much different uh, there's not a band overdubbing much a lot of the famous recordings from this time and age um, is basically a, a live recording in the studio um, this is wonderful I mean to some extent it's mostly like proto ambient um, I would say it's like 75% kind of proto ambient sound uh, and 25% is uh, progressive rock and uh, beautiful I don't know why but I totally feel drawn to this album here and had already, already been listening to it quite a lot um, something really fascinating about this um, yeah this uh, came out in 1976 and at this point the band didn't exist anymore for quite a while now um, I have a fourth album by Agitation Free here which is called River of Return now this one came out in 1999 and uh, so this is one of those situations where a band got together again um, and recorded this double album here. Um, when this happens I don't hold my breath because uh, this can go um, in all kind of directions as a result and uh, I'm usually not a big fan of uh, groups from the 70s that turn into this kind of a legacy act and, uh, um, and um, perform these kind of nostalgic concerts that have far too overpriced tickets and um, to quote the wonderful Bill Bruford, where the band is on the stage, but nothing is happening. They are not doing anything. <laughs> this is very different here. I think this is a wonderful record and I totally enjoy this from beginning to the end. Um, it sounds very different than their 70s material and rightly so. These musicians have completely uh, 
uh, evolved and uh, at this point like 25 years had passed and uh, so of course they did they recorded a bit of a different music um, but at the same time it has this uh, magical quality that's so typical for agitation free uh, a certain kind of freedom of expression. I think their music moved st stronger now toward a certain jazz fusion sound, but I would probably even call it jazz funk. I like this record. I mean, there is something nicely atmospheric about it and uh, they're just doing their thing, you know. So um, a River of Return, Agitation Free, actually a pretty good record. I very much enjoyed it. So um, what else do we have? And I have actually a lot of records here. Um, yeah, I was listening a little bit to Zelda. This is a nice uh, reissue on Faraway Records of this iconic Turkish album. Um, this came out, I think, in the late 70s or so maybe early 80s, but I think late 70s. Uh, Zelda is uh, one of the big names of uh, kind of Anadolu rock or Turkish psychedelic rock. Uh, and um, most of this record had been recorded with the, together with the band Molar. So that's what gives it this kind of a psychedelic uh, edge and makes it sound a little harder than uh, your typical Turkish pop album of the 70s. Um, she used to be a quite a controversial figure in the Turkish music scene, even being uh, thrown in jail for a while as this... Uh, well, protest singer um, against uh, the rather rigid uh, Turkish regime or government that was ruling in those years. It's a great record. Um, I mean, the the music is kind of a mixed bag because uh, it's 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 a bit like a zipper, where one song uh, has more of this cute atmosphere of a seven inch, meant for the radios, while the next track is a little more serious recorded with molar and having this uh, sweaty psychedelic sound and the next track is again more um, in the realm of pop music and um, but overall nice album and uh, great record to listen to in the summer uh, to stay with turkish music um, this is the last album by derya yildrim and the group shimshek um, this is called Dost One and as far as I'm informed very soon, somewhere in the next weeks, there will be a Dost Two. This already came out last year, I think, on, on the Bongo Joe label in, in Geneva in Switzerland. Um, this is a wonderful uh, four-piece. I really love this band. This is already the third album I have by Daria Yildrim. She's a singer and uh, she's playing an electric saz or balama and uh, have, which gives her music this uh, very kind of psychedelic uh, edge. Um, I think she lives in Germany, in the city of Hamburg. Um, as I said, this is a wonderful four-piece band with uh, Greta Ecott on drums and Antonin Voyan on guitar um, and uh, Graham Muschnik on organ and synthesizers and together they create this really cool, cool sound of, of Turkish folk music with this 60s organ-oriented atmosphere, uh, very jazzy and uh, very psychedelic at the same time and very, very pleasant listen overall. Now, compared with the previous album, I think this one is a little more riff-oriented, a little harder, if you can say that with this type of music, it's kind of edgier. Um, which is a development that I actually like. Um, they can really pull it off and still very, very pleasant album. Now, as I said, the organist and keyboarder of this, on this album is Graham Mushnik. And I got his solo album because I was curious how this sounds. And uh, this is uh, his record, Peeping Through the Porthole. Um, Graham Mushnik featuring the group Martini. Um, so um, this is a... Well, this is an interesting record to kind of tickle my sense of anemoya. Now, anemoya is this new word invented to um, express, um, to describe a notion or sense of nostalgia towards a time in the past that I did not really experience myself. Uh, and this could be really said about this album, because uh, everything about this record uh, breathes the 60s. It's this type of music that you associate with 60s spy movies, maybe very jazzy, very 
very uh, swinging all the time and um, it's kind of like imagine Henry Mancini and Graham Bond made an album together that's kind of how it sounds and um, brilliant records great fun uh, nothing uh, that would give you headache uh, it's uh, very funky and uh, very pleasant to listen very evocative but at the same time um, if you it's sure it kind of feels like you've just left the time machine in 1967 and went into the streets of San Francisco maybe or London but in truth if you look at the music of that time this type of music actually did not exist back in the day I mean it's more like a, a, this uh, fantasy of a very iconic 60s album and it works very well I would say and I wouldn't really regard it as a album that has a kind of library music vibe because it doesn't for that it has too much of uh, of Graham Mushnik's identity there is a lot of his idiosyncrasies in the sound and um, so brilliant record I really enjoyed it and um, this is uh, relatively new I think this album came out maybe 2020 I think because just can't see it here but I think this is from 2020 and a really cool sound I'm just um, I mean if 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 you put on this record while having some friends over to a little party in your living room no one will complain about this record I'm pretty sure about that <laughs> it's a cool one yeah so let's move on um, yeah let's get to some interesting stuff so uh, I've been listening to this one this is Making Music by Zakir Hussain um, recorded with uh, Hari Prasad Chaurasia, John McLaughlin and Jan Gabarik on the saxophone. Um, so this is one of those calm uh, ECM albums uh, where the music uh, takes its time and it's very kind of probing and exploratory and um, overall very pleasant. Um, there are like hills and valleys in the music and uh, the sound certainly finds its way to escalate um, um, there's a lot of improvisational stuff going on and uh, a lot of uh, moments where one of the musicians takes the lead um, so you get uh, great uh, guitar playing by John McLaughlin of course John McLaughlin plays uh, acoustic here but uh, to some extent I would say this album is quite dominated by Haris Pratt Charasia who plays all the flutes here and I guess his flute playing kind of gives um, uh, this album its first wave of identity and shape. Uh, but of course, as expected, you have a lot of amazing tabla solos by Zakir Hussein. Um, and uh, some very interesting uh, saxophone parts by Jan Gabarek. Um, so overall, it's uh, one of those uh, albums that create this type of Hindustani jazz and this may be an acquired taste for some but I don't find it too difficult to to digest um, because for that it's just far too pleasant to listen or most of the time it's more in this kind of exploratory mood uh, the music kind of trickles and is finding its way through the album so quite wonderful uh, making music uh, Zakir Hussein with uh, Hari Prasad, Chao Rasia, Jan Gabarek and of course the one and only John McLaughlin. And uh, to stay in Indian music, um, this is an album by Bridge Bushan Cabra together with Dakir Hussain. Um, it's called The Magic of Music, Guitar and Tabla. Now Bridge Bushan Cabra is basically the one artist that introduced uh, acoustic western guitar to Indian traditional music in the 60s and uh, he became the iconic figure for this type of sound um, so um, this this idea to include a acoustic kind of Spanish or West European or American uh, guitar to a purely Indian sound is this did not start with Shakti or John McLaughlin Bridge Bushan Cabra was doing this already in the 60s 
Um, of course, uh, he had to develop his own sound for that. So uh, it's a very, very different approach uh, to the acoustic guitar than, for example, John McLaughlin's playing in this type of environment or context. Uh, the guitar is very much um, treated here. I think the tuning is completely somewhere else. Um, and um, yeah, it has a very, very pleasant sound. I mean, there are only two tracks on this album. It's only guitar and Zakir Hussein on the tablas. And uh, it's just two ragas uh, and very, very pleasant. It's nice. It's a nice type of music to play maybe in the morning, Sunday morning when you wake up and drink your first coffee and don't want to be uh, showered uh, with ugly news on television. It's a much better idea to play some cabra and uh, those are really nice 30 minutes of pleasant, uh, very kind of meditative uh, guitar music combined uh, you know very in, in this kind of Hindustani traditional Hindustani sound and mood and 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 scale uh, with uh, some wonderful uh, percussive uh, company of Zakir Hussein. Yeah, um, I have some more records here. <laughs> 